The next segment we're going to do is talking about Newton and Kepler again, only this time we're going to look at Newton, uh, sorry, Kepler's second law and how that relates to angular momentum. Now, in order to do this, we've set up our system. So here we have uh, a star, in this case let's consider it to be the Sun, at the focus of an ellipse. There's a planet at position P going around in an elliptical orbit. As it moves along its orbit, it moves from position P to position Q. Its velocity will change and its position will change. Um, it has a radius vector R and it's going to move through an angle delta theta. Now, as long as this delta theta is very small, then again we can, and that we're measuring in radians, we can assume that this tiny little segment up here doesn't count. We've got a simple triangle and that um, we have this distance here is vt delta t. So we're moving at a distance, uh, we're moving at a speed vt. So the distance we move is in time delta t is vt delta t. And we've got an angle delta theta and a radius vector r. And the dis difference between this distance and this distance is negligible. So that's a pretty good approximation. Now, remember, we care about the area swept out. And so we have an area swept out by the line that's connecting the sun to the planet. And that's the area of this entire thing. But again, we can kind of ignore this little segment here. And we can say that the area is given by um, a half r. It's basically a half height times base. And so the base is, again, v vt delta t and r is the height that's over 2 so we've got the change in area so we can rearrange this so we get the delta t down here we've got delta a over delta t is given by r and the tangential velocity over 2 and this is the rate of change of area now remember according to second law the second law Kepler's second law the rate at which the area swept out is a constant. And so we've got delta A over delta T is a constant. Um, and this is essentially the same as angular momentum. So we've got the, the product of the um, distance of a particle from the origin times the component of linear momentum perpendicular to the line, that's VT, um, and you also usually have a mass in there. So we've got the angular momentum L is equal to the distance from the origin of the circular motion, the mass of the particle, and its tangential velocity. And so we can put that in, and we get L over M instead of RVT. And so you can see right away that this is this constantness means that it's just equivalent to the conservation of angular momentum. Uh, but this has some interesting consequences for how we look at the orbital motion. Um, but to understand it, we have to go through what an ellipse is. So here we have the setup of an ellipse. It's got a major axis and a minor axis. The major axis is defined by A, so the semi-major axis is A. The semi-minor axis is B, that's this direction. Um, and the eccentricity, E, is how flat it is. So if E is zero, then the um, the focus the foci these two foci end up at the center and you have a circle if you have this as one then they end up as a straight line um, but the but the other way of looking at it is that where the focus is is the semi major axis times the eccentricity so that gives you this distance to the focus okay so we have something at position a right here um, the if, if it is at position A, then the distance R prime bugger. Okay, so here we have, at any given point on the circumference, we've got from this focus here to this, this point is R, and from this point to this focus is R prime. Now, by definition, for uh, uh, an ellipse, the way this works is, you can think of it as being you've pinned down a string at points f and f prime, and you keep the string taut, and as you move the pencil that's tied to the string um, around, you will end up with um, an ellipse. And so this distance from the edge here and back again is always going to be um, 
it's it's always going to be two times the semi-major axis or the major axis. Um, so let's just go through and prove that. So now we have um, we have that something is at position A, and if you want to go from point F to the edge and then back to point F prime, you have to go from here, which is A minus A E. That's this R, right? And then R prime is you've actually got to go all the way along. So it's AE at this side and A at this side. And so you have AE plus A. And so when you add them together, the AEs cancel and you just get 2A. Okay? So that's where that comes from. Um, and so by definition, R plus R, sorry, R plus R prime is always 2A. Um, and in fact, you can go through and prove this, I'm not going to, um, that the average distance of a planet from the Sun is just the same major axis for this reason. Okay. Um, if we go to point B up here, we can see we've got R and R prime R here, and now we've got um, that they are equal, right? And so at this point, at this uh, at the the edge of the semi-minor axis, then the distance to both foci are the same, and they're just a. Um, and so, but we've got the we've got the Pythagoras theorem. So we've got um, b squared plus a e squared equals a squared, right? Because this is a right angle. This is the hypotenuse, and so on. And so we've got the relationship between the semi major axis, the semi major axis, and the eccentricity. So this allows us to rearrange that slightly. So now I've got that the semi-minor minor axis is equal to same major axis times the square root of 1 minus the eccentricity squared. OK, so what I want to do is to find an expression for the radius vector. So at any given position along here, I can define the distance from the sun to the planet um, in terms of the semi-major axis, the eccentricity, and the angle theta around the orbit, where at this point, where it's closest to the sun, it is at perihelion, that's what we call the closest point to the sun, um, and that would have a theta of zero, and at this point, it is furthest from the sun, the sun is at point F, then this would be aphelion, this is the furthest point from the sun, and it would have a theta of um, 180 degrees. So we can apply the cosine rule, so here I've got this triangle, I've got R, I've got R prime, and I've got this base that is 2AE. Two, two so this is AE to here and AE to here. Um, and I know what theta is. And so I've got this cosine rule that I can apply and plug in that Z, which is the longest side, is R prime, is equal to R squared plus 2AE squared plus 2R times 2AE cos theta. So now I have got uh, an equation that is giving me this triangle. But we already worked out that r prime is equal to r prime is equal to uh, 2a minus r, right? r prime plus r equals 2a. So I can plug that in to get rid of r prime, and then I can get rid of the brackets. So I've done my squaring. And then I can do some cancelling, so I can get rid of those two r squareds because there's one on each side, and get rid of the fours because they're all times but four. I can get rid of a couple of a's, and then if I do some simplifying, I get a minus r equals a e squared plus r e cos theta. And this is where we just got to. So I've got this equation. I can rearrange it so that I have a on each side. Remember, a is the seven major axis. R is, for any value of theta, the distance from the sun to the planet. And here I have theta. And so I can simplify this a little further. Just put some brackets in. Um, and rearrange it. So now I've got, if I know the semi major axis and I know the eccentricity and I know the phase of the orbit, is it at perihelion? Is it at haphelion? Is it somewhere in between? I can work out how far away a planet is from the Sun. So here's my radius vector. 
So for perihelion, remember that's the closest point to the sun, we said by definition we have theta equals zero, and so cos theta is one, and so I end up with that the, um, the distance from the star is given by the seven major axis, and then we've got this equation that includes the eccentricity. And so it's, and it simplifies quite nicely. So we get that for the perihelion point, the closest point to the sun, it's a times one minus the eccentricity. Likewise for aphelion, which is the furthest point, and you've got theta equals 180 degrees, you end up with similar situation, but now you have a equals, uh, sorry, r app equals a times one plus e. And so we've got this relationship between the perihelion and the aphelion point. So the bigger that E is, the bigger this difference is between the two points. So for the Earth, it's fairly circular. So there isn't actually that much difference between the perihelion distance and the aphelion distance. We're a little closer at perihelion, which is in January, and we're a little further at aphelion, which is in July. Um, but it's not a huge difference, whereas Pluto... Um, actually has got a huge eccentricity and comets have even bigger eccentricities so you get this uh, difference between the perihelion and the aphelion point that is huge and in fact that what this says is that for Pluto it is 40% closer at perihelion compared to aphelion. So here we have we're back to having uh, we've got dA by dt or delta A by delta T the rate of change of area is given by r v t, but for a whole area, we've got this whole thing. We this just turns into a over p, right? So we've got dA by dt is generally true, so it should be true that um, this would go to a over p, and so a over p equals r v t over two, averaged over the whole orbit. Um, and so now I've got that v t. This is the tangential velocity at a given point is given by the area, the period, and the r, which is the radius vector that we just worked out. Remember, we've got this radius vector, so this is how you get the change in the velocity as you move around. Now, for an ellipse, the area is given by pi a b. Remember that a is the semi-major axis and b is the semi-minor axis. It's kind of like uh, pi r squared, and goes to pi r squared for a circle. Um, and so we can plug this into um, here, we can put in the a here, we can put in the r here, and we get an equation for the tangential velocity at a given point is given by this equation. Now we can simplify that a little further, because we already worked this out, remember, that we've got uh, the semi-minor axis is related to the semi-major axis by the eccentricity, and so we can plug that in and get rid of the b. So I've simplified and got rid of the a's, and I've plugged in for this b, I've plugged this in, and now I can do just a little bit more simplification, because here I've got a uh, 1 minus e squared, and here I've got a square root of 1 over e squared, so there's a cancellation there. And so here I've got this equation, which tells me that the tangential velocity is given by the semi major axis, the period, the eccentricity, and the phase of the orbit. So here we are again. Here's this equation. So for any position, if I've got this, and I know what my eccentricity, and my period, and my so major axis are, I can work out the tangential velocity. At A, it's at perihelion, remember? This is where the sun is, so the, st the planet is closest to the sun at A, and furthest from the sun at A prime. But also, at those points, the tangential velocity is also the total velocity, right? So this is, the tangent is also all of it. And so for at A, we have theta equals zero, cos theta equals one, and if we plug that in, we get that the perihelion speed is given by this equation, which we can simplify a little, and we get this perihelion speed, which is given by A, seven major axis, P the period, and the eccentricity. We can go through the same exercise for aphelion. So at aphelion, we've got theta equals 180 degrees, so cos theta equals minus one, and we can again plug that in, and we get this equation. And so we have an, uh, an equation for the perihelion speed, so the velocity and speed, 
um, at perihelion is given by this equation. You can see here this is just inverted. And so you can work out how fast something is moving. If we do this for the Earth, we know what the Earth's seven major axes is. It's one AU. We know what its period is. It's one year. And we know that it has an eccentricity of 0 0.0167. So we can work out the difference between the speeds. Okay? So we're just going to plug in those numbers and we end up with uh, 30.3 kilometers per second at perihelion. So we're moving faster in January than we are in July. At perihelion speed is 29.3 by one kilometer per second. So we actually go through our winter months and the southern hemisphere summer months faster than we go through our summer months and their winter months. But we're very slightly closer to the sun in our winter months and their summer months. And that's it for this particular segment.